Whether it's way back in the day with the Team Rocket TCG set or Shadow Pokemon in Pokemon Go, I think we can just all agree that Dark or Shadow versions are just more cool. Gale of Darkness, it also leaned heavily into the Shadow Pokemon theme, but it's been nearly 20 years since that game came out. And it's a shame that its cover art Pokemon is just kind of this mythical figment from the past. Today I'll be sharing my vision for what Shadow Lugia in a Generation 1 solo challenge would look like, and this one, it's a spicy one. Welcome back to the channel where I like to do Pokemon solo challenges with the ultimate goal of ranking them against each other after a series of runs with optimizations. What you are watching today is a custom ROM. The sprites are from the 1997 Space World demo. The Lugia sprites and everything else is from yours truly. If you would like to play the patch file, it is available to channel members and Patreons. And the full rules and every other question, literally every other general question that you could possibly want to know, it can likely be found in the description, so check that out. And if you are a returning subscriber, like Bruins Girl 33, grab yourself a Sodi Pop and let's just get to it. Overall, this cross gen run, it's an amalgamation of several different things pulled from several different games, and I don't want to lose your attention, but it's something that we just have to go over, so let's just kind of hit the high points. Starting with the stats, it's a legendary, so things are going to be high across the board. The Chansey rule is something I'd like to talk about. It's going to benefit this Pokemon greatly, and if you didn't know, I use Chansey because we picked the highest stat from Special Attack and Special Defense, and having 154 in Special, it ties Mewtwo, which is pretty impressive in its own right. The level up learn set is going to be from Gen 8. I pick my sets before I play the runs, and I like this set because you don't get your signature move Aeroblast too late, and then you get access to Calm Mind, which I thought would be pretty great to have, but that's a story for later in the run. I replaced it with Growth since they are essentially the same move, and as for TMs, all you gotta know is Lugia gets everything. If it's a good TM, Lugia gets it, no need to go over it. Now let's pull up that Gale of Darkness, Shadow, and Purified sets, and this is where things get a little bit nutty. I took moves from both of these sides, and what we ended up having here was a pretty absurd starting set. Earthquake and Hydro Pump are here, we know those moves, and then we have Psycho Boost. This is the signature move of Deoxys, and fun fact for you guys, this is the only other Pokemon, this is the only other it Iteration ever to this day to get access to Psycho Boost. This move is hits like a truck, but it has a pretty hefty drawback of lowering your special two stages, and we'll talk about it more later. And then we have Shadow Blast to round out the starting set. We will need to dive deeper into that move and probably some other extra things as well, but let's leave this here for now and kind of get to the run. Today's run is going to be a clinic and doing the bare minimum, and it's a quick trot through Viridian Forest. I put the mandatory bug catcher in a coma after unleashing a shadow Pokemon right in his face, and now it's time for Brock. The intro, it was completely unnecessary because we have Hydro Pump, you already know how it's going to go, but the one thing I would like to touch on here is that our special moves have less than 100% accuracy. You're going to see me miss on the Geodude, and it doesn't really seem like this would matter that much, but if you remember back to that Kyogre run, we had a couple of sub 100 accurate moves, and they start to add up. You don't really think about it too much, but the time starts to compound, and another thing, I just think it's kind of funny when you imagine Brock week after week, he's just kind of wondering what I'm gonna bring into the gym. He's always sweating it, and today I think was specifically pretty rough for him. Poor guy, give me the badge. Moving ahead, I'd like to, let's take it down a notch. Let's get serious. I want to talk about PP for a minute. Lugia has extremely strong special moves, but the lower accuracy with only five power points each, it's not ideal. Earthquake has 10 power points and 90 attack isn't awful, but you don't really want to rely on it too much at the moment. And one of the challenges for the run overall was to kind of plan out power point usage to avoid slowing down. Now, finally, this is going to take us to actually talk about Shadow Blast. This is Shadow Lugia's signature move and it's like the counterpart to Aeroblast. Both of those moves have high crit ratios and in Gen 1 that means if you're over 64 speed you're going to be critting every single time you use it. It does have lower base power than Aeroblast and it doesn't get stab and you might notice that type icon out there. It, it indicates that it's Shadow. Now Shadow is more of a pseudo type. It's not an actual Pokemon type and it's the main thing that makes this run kind of unique over other runs. Lugia itself is going to retain its regular typings in Psychic and Flying and Shadow, here's what you need to 
should know there's two rules within Gale of Darkness. Number one, shadow is not very effective on other shadow types. And number two, it is super effective against any non-shadow Pokemon. Now since Kanto is full of loser normie Pokemon, we're going to be hitting for super effective damage all day today. It's going to be a long day in the office for a lot of these trainers. And if you're sitting there and you're thinking, hey, that sounds pretty strong, then duh. We implement and we make these runs to see if they can pass the Mewtwo bar. That's what it's all about, passing the Mewtwo bar. And we are dozens of runs, almost a full year into it at this point, and only two Pokemon have ever passed the test. Now I'm gonna go ahead and I'll say this once again. I think Alolan Ninetales is an unbeatable perfect run, but maybe Lugia can channel its inner darkness and actually surprise us. In Mount Moon, there's a pretty big change coming to the way I do some solo runs a little bit. Now, in general, in the solo run community, I think I've kind of like just proved everything that I wanted to prove. I've placed high in competitions, and I feel like I understand and know the game at a high enough level so that I can just kind of start taking it a step above that. And I've been, in my personal life, I've been practicing the actual speedrun of the game a lot. Shout out to Cheesy Speak Easy. Go ahead and comment world record hop down below. But to me, the manips in those, they're the hardest thing to do but they are also the most interesting things doing a lot of this it made me realize how much RNG is actually in Mount Moon and to make these runs more scientific and just be more accurate going ahead I've decided that it's time to take a cue from the speed run using game hook along with some code while working with Austin who was three seconds behind me in the Smeargle race I made it to where the game is essentially gonna check if I'm in one of the three Mount Moon floors and then it's gonna look at my second or my third party member depending on the run and if I don't have a Paris the game will have normal encounter rates it's gonna give me a Paris and when I catch it the game is gonna see that I'm still in Mount Moon I have a Paris now and subsequently it's gonna turn off the encounter rate down to zero this ultimately means that older runs they would be faster they'd probably be roughly like a minute a, I, don't, I don't really know I haven't done the math yet but maybe like a minute faster and we'll eventually we'll redo some of those but that's a problem for another day I'm not too worried about it but it just feels so good and if you think about this think about this for a second slacking and ground in their tied and I can guarantee you that the difference is solely from the Mount Moon encounters. Let's say that Groudon maybe got unlucky had 17 encounters but Slacking maybe got a solid 8 encounter run. It's just not really fair to Groudon in that situation. It didn't lose on the merit of it being a worse Pokemon. It lost because it had bad luck in Mount Moon. It doesn't feel good to me. Overall I really like this change and I think it's a step in the right direction. I really wanted to talk about it and now we can kind of have like Mount Moon visits similar to the winner of the Parasect race so I'm excited excited about that. As for the actual gameplay here, I'm not battling a single thing in here that I don't have to. I'm fully focused on speed today and we can just pick straight back up at rival number two. And now we can just kind of dive into Psycho Boost a little bit more. It's 140 base power, 210 with stab. It's an absolute nuke. I have to use it on Pidgeotto just so we can have a pretty good chance at the one shot. No sand attack today, but I want you to focus on my special when I use it. Self lowering your special by two stages halves your special. And this is a steep penalty and it's much worse than it is in the modern day Pokemon games. This means that we're going to hit roughly half as hard with special moves and any special moves that hit us is going to hit much harder. This ultimately means that Psycho Boost is kind of like your closer. It can give you a badge boost, a single badge boost, but Shadow Blast and its high crit rate means that it's just going to ignore that anyway. But it really made for some interesting choices and an interesting dynamic to play around. I actually didn't like this that much in my first couple of tests, but when I started to look at the numbers, I actually started to really enjoy this move, and it doesn't hurt that I actually really like Defense Deoxys specifically a lot. We've talked about PP earlier, and sit down again, son. It's time to talk about PP again. Nugget Bridge and the route to Bill's house, don't make me say it, we don't have to go into it. Yes, you're right, it's the single highest cluster of mandatory battles, it's found right here. Now if you're healing, you're using weaker moves, your runs, they're just not gonna be great. And for this run, it's important to have this part pretty meticulously planned out. And you can see that when we make it to the end of the route, we have exhausted almost all of our PP. We have a Psycho Boost to kind of banish the first unlucky Oddish that sticks its head out. Then we have like a handful of Shadow Blast. And this part of the run was a huge success because we can kind of parlay this directly into Misty without healing. And there's gonna be several moments like this in the run where lesser Pokemon would have to heal, but we kind of just squeeze every last ounce of juice just to shave off a few seconds here and there. We have three Shadow Blasts and that's the exact number that you need because if you 
went in here with just two like I tried on earlier iterations of the run, then Starmie has a chance to survive just like it does here, and that's why three is the right call. Oftentimes I'll touch on how being riskier and taking more chances can lead to better times, and I think that's 100% the approach that everyone should take, but something that I never talk about is safe strats and having backups. Things like this, keeping an extra shadow blast, it was just one example, and there are lots of little things that I do in every run just to guarantee parts of the run, maybe to where I won't make a silly little mistake, and it's just like the ebb and flow I always talk about with speed and consistency, the balance of risky and safe strats, it's right up there with it. Now let's take it down to the SSN, and today we see a beautiful sight. Lugia, it's gonna skip everything. We're walking past Body Slam, we're giving the middle finger to the gentleman and his rare candy, and now it's straight to rival number three, and this one, it's an absolute demolition because we aren't tethered to carefully managing our PP like we were in the first fight. We got to skip everything. We just start letting blasts loose. Everything's on fire. Pidgeotto is squawking. I don't think Raticate's moving anymore. It's just pandemonium. And then the chaos, it doesn't stop there. Surge, he sees a gigantic shadowy bird come into his gym. And just like with Charizard Lugia, it's a rare flower with ground coverage. And that just means we can continue our leisurely stroll straight through Kanto. <laughs> Afterwards, Thunderbolt is the first upgrade that we've got in the run. The coverage is great. Hydro Pump at this point is just not really pulling its weight. And we're going to stick with this move for quite a while. We, Thunderbolt's really good. You don't need me to tell you that. And then afterwards, when we dig out, notice that I don't heal in Cerulean. This all kind of goes into optimization and just saving time wherever you can. I have enough power points here to comfortably make it to the center before Rock Tunnel. And subsequently, that's going to let me throw out more Shadow Blast and just have a little bit faster time. But we don't have to go into it. We can skip past it, we can pick back up in Celadon. First up is the Rocket Hideout, and the thing to note here is that I'm picking up a single PP up. Normally, these do not save time. They just make runs easier, but today, there were so many points in practice in the run where I just wish I had a little bit more PP, and even though this is one of the best Pokemon that I've ever played, it needed to up the PP just a little bit. It was missing like an inch or two. Now, I'm not picking up any high money items, and I'm gonna go into that soon, and just kind of like a general kind of shift in my philosophy how I plan out routes and stuff like that. But as for Giovanni, it's kind of a rare case where you're going to open with Psycho Boost. That's going to give you the attack badge boost and give you just a little bit better of a range on the Rhyhorn with Earthquake. And then you can just kind of close out the battle. That takes us to shopping. And now I can elaborate on not picking up the high money items. Here's the conclusion that I've came to after practicing the speed run and just playing a lot of Pokemon in general. Good runs, I think they can just forgo all vitamins and save the time. But I haven't fully pinned that in as a fact yet. Speed is the only binary vitamin you either outspeed or you don't and if you can maybe get a few speed points maybe outspeed a bad matchup it can be the difference of a lot of time but things like calciums and protein just don't matter that much outside of exceptions that you would probably examine on a per run basis I do pick up three calciums here but visualize this vitamins roughly give you around a point of damage for each use that's not exact it's not an exact figure but having calciums versus not having the calciums it's the difference between let's say we look at Lorelei's slow bro it's the difference between 37% chance to one shot it to being 47% with three calciums. 10% extra isn't bad, but I think the critical thinking you need to do for speed runs is that ask yourself, is it worth the 30 seconds or so that you spend doing this? And in general, you have to kind of examine everything extra that you do and determine if it actually serves a purpose. But I think that's a topic for another day. From there, we can start to kind of rapid fire some segments. Erica's first in the order. We have an excellent matchup here, and I'm not going to lie to you guys, using Psycho Boost felt really good once you start to master it a little bit. You would think that I would use it on the victory belt up front, but from my test, the Vile Plume was the one that usually ended up putting a status on me, and the range is just better for Shadow Blast on the victory belt, so there's no real commentary here. Let's take a look at some more fodder. This takes us to Pokemon Tower, and we have not healed since we anchored ourselves to the initial Celadon visit. The main thing here, we want to save two Shadow Blasts for the next Ghastly fight, but Thunderbolt and Earthquake, it gives us coverage that just works out here. I will say that in practice, I had a reset similar to something like Mewtwo's Zubat mishap. I Gen 1 missed Shadow Blast, I got confused, I hurt myself twice, and I got finished off with a Nightshade. I immediately just restarted the run and went outside for a few minutes if you're wondering about that. Next, we can quickly zoom through the Safari Zone, and just like the vibe 
vitamin chit chat we had earlier, there's no need to pick up anything. Just skip the vitamins. The full restore is important because you can bank two of them and skip the elite four buy. But those of you who actually do these runs too, try doing runs without vitamins first and then route them in later if you need them. It kind of makes me sad when I watch runs that just pick up carbos when they don't need to or doing something absolutely ridiculous like picking up irons 90% through the run in Pokemon Mansion, but I digress. Play how you want to play. I don't care. I'm just trying to help. Next up is Sylph, and I always say that if you could knock this out first, it's overall just a little bit faster. Lugia today is going to take a cue from Alola, Ninetales, and Raichu, and it's just going to skip the 10th floor entirely. That's going to leave us with nothing but business today, and as we do the rounds and we prepare for that big fight, I am going to make a hard pivot here and use all five of the rare candies I've gathered to this point, and let's just see how rival number five goes. I pinpointed this specific battle as the sole cause of slowing down my previous runs and the candies, they do some pretty important things. The most important thing is that it puts Pidgeotto into a guaranteed one shot range, meaning that we can avoid sand attacks and that's always a huge plus. As for Galath, we do have EQ and it is the smarter play to use it here. Overall, you want to get through the Sylph battles, you want to move to Sabrina and you want to do it with smart PP usages. You will see me use Shadow Blast on the Execute and the Alakazam, but trust me when I say that in my earlier runs I was kind of just tossing out shadow blast like one dollar bills at the strip club and the extra time started to add up overall the extra levels were the thing that helped the most here doing this at like level 32 it was doable but it felt like it took about double the time and there was even some risk in here so what you just watched here and just overall improving this battle it was the key to the time that we're ultimately going to see at the end but that's really all there is to say shadow lugia is a monster When we are done with Seal, this is something else I talk about sometimes, but in a run where you really don't ever have to heal, there are about four points that it's worth to anchor yourself for some strategic dig warp point. The first is that initial Cerulean visit, second is Celadon when you first arrive, and the third is here in Saffron if you can immediately tackle Sabrina. It just makes it really efficient, and when runs can just plow through the game, when you're like a high tier run, the overworld movement and the routing choices, those are the real differences at the end. For Sabrina, I have the damage, and I out speed the first three Pokemon so I can just kind of trivialize them. Shadow Blast does the job and I cycle boost Venomoth just because it's a stupid Pokemon. And even though I'm one speed short of Alakazam, we've already kind of seen how Sabrina's AI handles psychic mirror matches. It'll just go for recover forever and buddy, there's no recovering from this shadowy blast that's about to send you straight to the Shadow Realm. Now it's down to Fuchsia and the reason for going to the Safari Zone earlier, and I guess the reason why it doesn't waste any time is that you unlock the flight point. Since Lapras is the strength and surf user of choice for these solo runs, already having it here before you go into the gym is just another little overworld efficiency type thing. It's also worth noting that you don't actually get this candy in the speed run, but since you're here, you're teaching surf and strength anyway, I see very few reasons not to just learn those, pick it up, and just be on your way. As for Kogo, we already had a killer matchup here earlier, even pre sylph and those extra levels, it just makes it that much faster. Now, even at our current level, there's only one realistic way to make this battle last only four turns, and that's if you get a crit on the muck and we actually get it here. It's really not that unlikely given that we have over a 21% chance to crit, but when I do these runs it's always kind of cool to see luck go my way since it usually doesn't. And we finish off this with another psycho boost just to kind of assert our dominance here. Afterwards, we can relax. Just relax a little bit, guys. We can take that brisk swim down to Cinnabar. We've been going at breakneck speed. But today, I would like to give a special shout out to this one extremely annoying wheezing that decided to show up through the repels in every single practice run I did. And from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to tell it that I can just go drown itself on the coast of Cinnabar. I do pick up Blizzard here. And really, the only other thing to mention is taking just a little tiny second to ponder if the 28th TM is actually Doomstoner, brother, or not. Now Lugia told me it wasn't, but I think that's just the darkness talking. He really didn't mean it. Don't judge him too harsh because of that. Now for one of the few times during this pretty immaculate run, I kind of fumble my moves. I make a mistake here. The first few Pokemon, they're not much to look at. I can Earthquake, get past those first two pre-evolved Pokemon, and it's crazy to think that Shadow Blast actually does more damage overall than a super effective Earthquake does. Remember that non-Shadow Pokemon take super effective damage from it, but my blunder, it comes on the Arcanine. Now I've been finishing off battles with Psycho Boost all day and you 
know that's what I'm going to go for here. And with 154 base special, you would think it might be enough, but I just cannot one shot this thick puppy. It gets a super potion. And my mistake here was using a second psycho boost instead of EQ or shadow blast. Since our special dropped two stages, it does hang on. It can't even do 40% of its life. It gets off another move and I have to finish it off on the next turn. This doesn't really mean much in the grand scheme of things, but it could have been done better. But guys, remember when you start to psycho boost, it's like a Pringle. It's hard to stop. Going into the last gym, the only thing to say is that I do learn Blizzard here. I replace Earthquake, and that's because Shadow Blast can kind of cover Earthquake's niche here. And let's just take a look at the last gym. Blizzard was needed here because even though he's not much of a challenge, his Pokemon do have really high defense. And you can't just start Psycho Boost and you have to wait for your moments. You can't, don't Psycho Boost too early. As a master of the Psycho Boost, this is all I'm telling you guys. And Blizzard overall just kind of gives you the ranges to make this take the least amount of turns that it can. Now, Doug Trio is paper thin it would die to a paper cut but i do use blizzard everywhere else and at the end of the fight i just can't help myself i'm scratching my neck i need a i need a hit i'm rubbing my hands together i unload that finishing cycle boost and that's going to give us the eighth badge now after the fight i use an elixir this is also something that really isn't talked about too much but there's five easily accessible elixirs in the run they cost pretty much no time to get but the key to kind of minimizing unnecessary poke center visits is timing how many of these elixirs you can use and how many you would need for the Elite Four, and then you can take the extra and start to use them in strategic parts like this just to keep you going in that straight line path, and that's going to lead us straight into rival number six. Now we could just, we can cliff note this battle. It's not necessary to go into detail. We have all the ranges and we can just kind of roll through it. We got Blizzard for the first two Pokemon. Shadow Blast can handle the other psychic types. I'm not even gonna talk about Growlithe, but at the end of the fight, this Blastoise has the unmitigated gall to actually survive a Psycho Boost. And I had to hold Lugia back after this. It was really angry. It was not happy at the level of disrespect that was just shown, but I calmed it down. Let's just look ahead. So as we head to the league, I have a couple of notes to say about the run. The first is something that I totally just forgot to talk about earlier, and I don't want to have to redo the audio, so I'm curious if there's going to be any comments about it later. It's growth. We learned it at level 27, or we didn't learn it, I should say, but we didn't use it at all. I guess bringing it up this late in the video is kind of self-explanatory because of how well the run has went to this point, but there was just no places where you couldn't get the ranges you needed, and there was just no need to take turns to set up. Now, there's a reason why, if you look at the vanilla team, tier list, Mewtwo, Alakazam, Articuno, there's a reason they're at the top and that's because they have to waste no time setting up any moves. Most elite runs, there are some exceptions, they just don't need to badge boost and there's really no spots in the game that it would really help out a lot. It could make some battles safer and more consistent, but like I've said a million times, safe and consistent just doesn't equal fast. But growth was interesting, and it reminds me a lot of the Kyogre run where we simply just didn't need it even though we could have learned it. And I guess that's really all there is to say about it. I did want to at least mention it. Now the second thing is my rare candy and experience management, they, they were not great in this run. I think this run is great, and it's going to finish very strong, but the one flaw is that I kind of just use my rare candies on the fly instead of just like following the plan that I had already laid out. And I tend to do that sometimes. I listen to the, I just go with my impulse. We'll see how it plays out, but I am skipping the Victory Road Rare Candy. I do have a few candies left. That means I'm going to be level 48 for Lorelei. And if you want to know what the difference could be in using early candies, like how that would impact your level, I was actually level 51 in the same position on earlier iterations of the route. So this is going to be a little more risky considering that we are actually weak to ice. But let's see if Shadow Lugia is up to the test or if it's going to be a little bit too chilly for it to get past the start of the Elite Four. So this was a huge risk, it goes without saying, and this is the one spot where growth would actually be pretty good. Lorelei has bulky Pokemon, and even with even if you had like 200 base special, being under leveled means that I cannot one shot the Dugong. And of course, turn one, it's immediately gonna crit on an Aurora Beam, and I'm kinda sweating at this point. I thought I was just gonna have to redo the run, but we take it out, and like always, let's just play it out and see how it goes. Cloyster has low base HP, so this one shot is guaranteed, not much to really talk about. And as for Slowbro, it doesn't have any ice 
moves and remember this is the Pokemon I used for example with the vitamins earlier and you can see that the extra 10% chance just didn't matter at all because I missed the range but a retroactive super potion just kind of seals its fate either way. Jinx is physically frail we can just go for shadow blast and guys let me just say sometimes it's all right to be lucky. Now given our topping it means that Lapras can go for Blizzard or Confuse Ray. It comes in and I'm gonna get the 50-50 here. It goes for Confuse Ray but I still need to hit a move. I roll the dice. I avoid hitting myself in confusion and after hitting that 50-50 I escape Lorelai with my life and remember very important sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. The age-old saying just don't forget it. Next we get a little break it's Bruno. I do have to go for Blizzard on the two Onyx. Onyx is Onyx Eye so I guess I could miss but there's not really a threat here. Now tell me in the comments if you miss Hacker Anthony from the cross gen runs I did earlier I'll consider putting him back in but the only thing to really talk about here is that this is another battle I'm getting hopped here it's another battle ending with psycho boost Next is Agatha, and Ghost just doesn't scare this shadowy bird thing. I'm actually not sure what Lugia is, really. Notice I didn't even heal other Bruno. I'm still pretty low, but Shadow Blast just kind of like fills in where Earthquake normally would be used. But the only variation to this strategy to just Shadow Blasting everything is that I actually use an earlier Psycho Boost to murder the Golbat because the range is just wasn't great for Shadow Boost. And just like that, we're three members down. We're looking ahead at Lance. Gyarados in the fight in general is going to be really simple. We have Thunderbolt. It's going to go down, but I will say that I had this really cool experience routing in the original runs where I would be level 53 here. I would knock out Gyarados, hit level 54, and I could learn Aeroblast and just replace Thunderbolt, and it felt really great. But I used the earlier candies here for no reason at all, and we're just lower level. The only thing that isn't perfect about this fight is that we don't outspeed Aerodactyl, but I'd rather save the time not picking up all those Carboses than trying to outspeed Aerodactyl for no reason. But with Blizzard, you kind of get the gist of how this one's going to go, how it went. It's clean, it's fast. Now it's time for the champion. On Pidgeot, there's no need to go for the lower accuracy Blizzard because Thunderbolt will do the job. And after that, one-shotting Alakazam, it's something that I just, I never get tired of it. Go go in the corner and play with your spoons, kid. For Rhydon, we do need Blizzard because we do not want to lower our special just yet. We hit it, and then the thick puppy's coming in, and it can actually survive a move, but it's not really that big of a deal. I will say that Ice Beam, this would have been a run where Ice Beam would actually have been good enough, if not for one Pokemon. And we actually had Aeroblast on other iterations, we'll get to that that in a second but executor it's just so annoying and we crit here and that helps out a lot it saves us a turn i am a little sad that we don't get to see aeroblast absolutely destroy this thing but it works out just the same as we make our way to the end of the fight get ready for a real cheek clincher i go for thunderbolt i know it's not going to one hit but psycho boost it's not the play because it's going to be a death sentence to lower our special with blizzard on the table the champion lets a blizzard loose and it crits but lugia is a bulky bird i don't even know if it's a bird why do i keep saying that but lugia says not today we survive on the red health and the skies are clear we got the all clear to finish off the battle the only way that makes any sense in my little lizard brain and that's one more psycho boost for the road Shadow Lugia finishes the game with a time of 1 hour 51 minutes and 54 seconds and that's a fantastic time but it does fall just short of the Alolan Titans but there's a bright side here what it didn't fall short of was passing the Mewtwo bar and this makes the fourth Pokemon to do so when you take into account the slacking redo stream and that's going to move this one to the bronze position on the cross gen tier list now the numbers are going to be tweaked on the tier list here this is actually future Matt talking to you the bulk of this video was recorded and pretty much finally before I even did the slacking or Alolan Raichu streams. So I had to make some adjustments and come back in and redo the audio. Now without getting too mathy here, I got a ton of data points. I got a really good approximation for the time that you would save in Mount Moon. And I kind of readjusted the numbers for the whole tier list. So they are slightly, the in-game times are tweaked. But I did preserve the 0 to 100 number, but it's just it's something to keep in mind. But my final thoughts here on Shadow Lugia is that it deserves it. It's one of the most unique runs I've ever done, and it's a Pokemon that's only found in one game that's two decades old, and it was just really cool to get the chance to put my spin on it and kind of bring it back to life. Now, if you have a problem with how strong some of the moves are or my choices for this, get over yourself. I refuse, I'd outright refuse to have Pokemon like this be put into a game 
and just have it use Scratch or some standard Gen 1 moves. It sounds boring, and I will say everyone is entitled to their own opinion, even if it's wrong and stupid, but that's it for me. I didn't get as many videos as I would have liked to have out for October, but the ones I did get out, I feel like they were really high quality. I'm really proud of that. But special shout out to my channel members and Patreon supporters. It does mean a ton. And if you made it this far into the video, you're a real one. And I just, I really appreciate it a lot. I hope you have a great week. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. We're going to start rounding out the year very soon. And that's about it. Bye.